Okay, let me just hit the volume like that. And I think we are good to go. Hello, I'm Paul Orselli, and today I'm super happy to be joined by Jillian Thomas. Uh, where, actually, Hi. where where are you today, Jillian? I'm in the south of France. There we are. So through the magic of technology and Zoom, we, we are crossing continents. And so, uh, Jillian, uh, you were kind enough to come on today. And so what's just one thing about exhibits you would like to tell people about? I think they really have to be amusing. And that sounds extremely lightweight, but I'm going to go with it and say why I think this is so important. I've been working in museums a long time. I've been lucky enough to work in different countries, France, England, and the US, and, and seen museums and lots of others. And one thing I really like to do, and I find very helpful, is to watch visitors. So often, if you take like a typical Saturday or Sunday afternoon, a lot of people arrive then, and you'll see families coming in. And sometimes these families have had a bad journey. So maybe they couldn't, they had a row in the car. I don't know. They couldn't find anywhere to park. There was probably one adolescent in the family who didn't want to come anyway, who's kind of shuffling along behind, doesn't want to be with them at all. And they look thoroughly miserable. And then you feel sorry for them and you hope they're going to have a good time. And then you don't really watch them all the, through the afternoon, but just sometimes you see the same family on the way out, except it's not the same family because they're talking to one another and laughing and the adolescent's holding his sibling's hand. And they've just obviously had a really good time. And I think to myself, well, we've added to the sum of human happiness. We've increased their sense of well-being. Actually quite hard to say what is this magic that we managed to achieve, but it's you're onto something and you really need to kind of work out what it is and see how you can make that the experience that everybody enjoys. To turn a dysfunctional family into a cohesive and happy one. I just think that's great. I, I, I know there are, um, just like there are gross domestic product indexes, there are happiness indexes in, in yeah. countries and so, I think maybe that's an interesting way to evaluate, yeah. uh, 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 you know, not every museum experience, but some museum experiences, like how, how have people's happiness or how, how, has, yeah. how happy are, are people after they are leaving a museum experience, so. Yeah, some restaurants are doing that, sort of assessing people coming in and seeing if they're happier going out, which you hope they would be. And there's some studies going on about how museum visits increase well-being. So John Falk is doing that and some uh, up with Milo, Miko in Finland. So I think there is a sort of area here, but we'll sort of get on to why I think it's important. So I've worked in science museums, science centers and children's museums. And the science museums, if you think about it, it's like if you're not a regular museum visitor, you've got science, all kind of frightening, a museum, old, dead and boring. So I've been up there with like funeral parlors or some other kind of concept that you don't really want to go to. And some years ago, when I was at the Science Museum in London, they carried out a study of people who did not visit or had not yet visited the Science Museum to see what sorts of things people were thinking about visiting and try to classify the various attractions and museums in London into two groups. And these groups were called want to, I actually really, really want to go there, and ooh, ought to, and you can guess which one the Science Museum was in. Now, it's not actually as bad as it sounds, because if you think about it in the, for the UK and England, there's a lot of people living there. If they all think they ought to, they'll turn up sometime, maybe that three times in a lifetime visit we talk about when you're seven, when the parents are seven, the kids seven, and when your grandchild's seven, but they ought to come. But that doesn't mean they're going to necessarily enjoy it. More recent data, PGAV, the voice of the visitor, for 2021 that came out, I'm afraid shows something a little bit similar uh, in terms of what people had visited. The science centers and children's museums were the absolute bottom. Now, this is like just post COVID. So I know people were preferring to go out and prefer the national parks or places with gardens and so on. And uh, art and history museums were sort of halfway down. I thought that might be due to the fact that they're not generally super full of people so that people would be more spaced out and less worried about COVID there than in like a children's museum packed out with kids that are all breathing bacteria everywhere and viruses. 
But it does mean that you've got a kind of challenge there. For most people, these are not things at the top of their list for where they might want to go. And for the coming year, in the same document, it's showing that um, things that people want to do, visiting friends and relatives is very popular. So when they were coming, they could be coming, but it doesn't specify anything to do with this area of science museums, science centers, children's museums. And also intergenerational travel is popular. So focusing on these groups is a way ahead, but for the moment, it's not the top of everybody's mind. So let's just go back a bit to what Paul was saying. Why is this important? Well, people really want me to enjoy the experience. Why? They need to relax for themselves, but they need to relax because we want them to engage with the things that are there in the museum. And unless they're in a kind of play type mind frame, willing to have a go at stuff and are feeling relaxed and comfortable and happy, they're not actually going to have much of a time. And the majority of parents that come, especially if they're not regular museum visitors, are in an ought to frame of mind. So we ought to go because this ought to be good for the kids. And you actually kind of see them offering their kids up for stuff like, here you go, have a go, and sort of pushing them forward to participate in things that they could participate in too, but it's for the kids. I've also seen parents uh, with kids who'd be quite happy to run around and get involved, holding them tightly by the hand because they're <laughs> frightened of this museum, right? And they don't want to let their kids go because they might do the wrong thing and get into trouble. So this whole business about making it comfortable, friendly, welcoming, it's actually really important before you even kind of get over the threshold. We talk a lot about getting over the threshold, but you've got to get over the threshold in the right frame of mind. And quite a few surveys show that at this particular moment in time, when many people are feeling stressed and overworked and underpaid and threatened in one way or another, that people are looking for relaxing, switch off, comfortable kinds of things to do. And that's where museums can really play an important part, because if you can get them engaged, then they're definitely going to be doing something special. So charming. Uh, um, important. Yeah, so I'm so I'm just wondering, uh, especially since you 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 brought up science museums, which uh, a lot of people, rightly or wrongly, <laughs> think about as serious. Um, how how do you inject that sort of humor and comfort into a situation like that? That that's part one. But also, I, I can just hear some of our colleagues saying. Well, you're just dumbing down uh, the the meaningful experience of science or history or art or that, you know. So, what what do you say to those people? They're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's it. That's the end of the video. I guess we've settled everything. Well, I uh, no, so I, I think you need the other stuff as well, right? I think you need everything. You need to use every single kind of. Um, interpretive strategy you can think of from immersive experiences, AR, VR, hands-on programs, everything. But you've got to get people in the right frame of mind before they can really enjoy it. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about getting rid of all the rest. I'm talking about thinking how, when you actually, actually get to the site, get to the car park, get out of the car and get near to the entrance desk, what can you do in that whole setup to make people feel better about it and what kinds of activities don't have to cost very much will make them feel different. So I, I, I thought I might just give a few examples, Paul. Yeah, that's great. Really enjoyed that would seem thing. So, so the, mostly it's about surprises. So things which are unexpected, ambiguous, incongruous, those are things which make people laugh. They try to make people in on a shared joke, right? And a joke has to be something that you share with somebody, not like just your own personal joke. So getting that sense that we all know what this is, is something that's important. You're in that circle of knowing. So one of my favorite people that does exhibits I really love is Tim Hunkin. And he's an engineer and a cartoonist, and he does really special things which have quite deep science content, but are nonetheless surprising and amazing. And first time I worked with him was when we were doing the Eureka, the Museum for Children up in Halifax in the UK. And I saw this sketch of his, of Archimedes falling into a bath. And he actually ended up making us a giant one that is like a clock because it happens every half hour. So as you go in, before you get to the ticket desk, Archimedes may well fall into a bath 
There's a most amazing splash of water, which surprises everybody. And then the Archimedes screw winds the water back up into the bath again. So it's based on a, sim a principle. There's some serious science. It is a surprise. You weren't expecting it. It makes you laugh. And it's a really good startup for saying this is what Eureka is about. It's actually under refurbishment at the moment, but it is, I think, 30 years since you built it. So it's not oh, wow. entirely surprising. Yeah, it's been falling in the bath for that length of time. And there's a range of other artists that work with Tim in the Cabaret Mechanical Theatre. And similarly, they're all little mechanisms which are intriguing and surprising and funny, but they're all based on sound principles which actually make the world go round. So I think that's one really important aspect that you're trying to do. So another one is the Exploratorium is full of fun things, right? And uh, uh, the Exploratorium cookbook is a real source of delights. And mirrors are similarly something that you can make that um, make people surprised. So my favorite one, just as you're walking up to the entrance, is a mirror on a stub wall. And one person goes ahead, stands behind the wall, raises their arm and leg, and for people approaching, they're flying. Right. And it's like, wow. Yeah. It's, the it's the, much, the, right? the, the so so-called anti-gravity mirror. That's correct. That's correct. There are other mirrors as well, and I just think that's a very simple thing. It doesn't cost much, but you have to find the right location for it. I was in exhibition quite a long time ago by an artist, because artists often can deliver you something that is surprising by somebody called Daniel Buren. And it was actually in an art museum where they were about to renovate a rather boring old gallery, and he'd installed a black and white striped tent with peepholes. And it was interesting, they're at different levels and you'd wander along and you'd look through one peephole and you'd see a whole painting. You look through another and you see a bit of a painting. And then sometimes you look through and you actually saw where the guard would have been sitting on a chair and he wasn't, or the fire extinguisher. So it was sort of intriguing and funny. And it lulled you into this sense of bending down, reaching up, looking in the window. And you went round a corner, you did the same thing again and something totally horrible came up against your face. And it really gave you a <laughs> horrible shock. And actually what it was, was a mirror and it was your eye looming up at you that just gave you this horrible surprise, right? So you've had the surprise and then the person or people you're with, they have a go and then you've got this shared funny thing again that you'll remember for a long time, like I'm remembering it now. It's the same sort of thing as on those sensory exhibitions, smells in a box, right? So you're supposed to be exploring and identifying smells and it's rose, jasmine, lavender, rosemary, thyme, and stinky cheese, right? Yeah. Or, a, or a skunk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and haven't you seen those kids that then go and find the family who hasn't, remember that hasn't seen this and ask them to have a go? And then everybody laughs again at the end, right? So you've been having the experience about exploring your senses, but it's the funny thing that makes you remember it. It's it's interesting too. Uh, a lot of those examples that you gave, they they sort of are they sort of set up this virtuous feedback loop. Like it, you you had this experience, and then you want to seek out a similar experience, or have somebody else in your group or your family like you want to show them this experience. So yeah. it it it's that sort of breaking the threshold again in a in a positive and funny and a, a yeah. comfortable way. Yeah, and there are a lot of, aren't there, a lot of illusions, like those holes in the floor that I think are good. They're just like surface treatment. It's not a very expensive thing to do, but it's definitely something that people love and are surprised by and enjoy. And uh, there can also be forbidden topics uh, that you sort of show through graphics and other things, such as how do astronauts go in space? That's something people always like to find in the washrooms if they haven't seen it before, right? Those sorts of topics are also fun. And then I don't think we should forget about um, things where they're not just about visual stuff, right? So things that feel different. So uh, quite a long time ago, I was watching an, an exhibition. It was a tingly exhibition of interactives, moving mechanical pieces. And it was a big one and it went on for a while. So you could sit down. So you sat on this bench, and you started watching it and then you suddenly realized that you were being tipped backwards because the bench you were sitting on was part <laughs> of the experience right and it wasn't frightening but it was definitely funny and not what you anticipated right and so i think those sorts of things where you think you're going to sit on a hard seat but it's actually soft 
They're physical, which are important because not everybody has great visual acuity and they need to be sought out and thought through and integrated as well. So these are just some of the examples that I've loved, Paul. There are thousands more out there. We might do a collection of cheap and simple things that people love that are funny. Um, and that would be kind of something we could all enjoy just to get yeah. people over the threshold. Well, in, in, in that spirit, and uh, especially you mentioned Tim Hunkin and uh, John Falk and some other things, since, since we're on YouTube, and Tim Hunkin's definitely on YouTube, so yep. we'll include some links uh, to okay. some of the things that we spoke about. And I guess I just, I'd just like to end up and cap off and, and thank you for today, but I, I'd just like to underline something you said earlier, which is this sort of unexpected aspect of humorous or exciting situations yeah. and the the example you gave in the Tengale e exhibition with the with the bench sort of going out i think looking for those unexpected ways to treat topics or unexpected ways to involve the exhibitions or displays is really a nice way to bring in those aspects of humor and enjoyment to the experience yeah. so we want people to have something where they have a sense of delight in what they were doing right it's beyond fun it's delight that's what we're after that you get involved you relax you're really enjoying it and you can share it with your family and friends well thanks jillian i was delighted to speak with you today and i appreciate you sharing just one thing about exhibits thanks very much thank you for the opportunity i enjoyed it Bye for thank now. you